Our next speaker is the senior iOS and Cocoa instructor at Big Nerd Ranch. He's the co-author of Objective-C Programming, the Big Nerd Ranch Guide, Mikey Ward. <clears throat> All right. Yay, it works. Cool. I, uh, testing? All right. I originally wrote this talk to be an hour long, and I've tried to shorten it as much as I can to fit into this time, and so I hope you'll Bear with me as I talk fast and take you on a whirlwind tour of XPC and my harrowing experience trying to learn how to use it properly in a couple of different contexts. My story starts, when I turn on my slide, there we go. Uh, my story starts actually in uh, last year when we had our annual Clash of the Coders, which is at BNR what we do is once a year for about 72 hours, we shut down the entire company and all of the nerds self-select into small teams and we each try to build something awesome. And then we are graded by the management team, Aaron included, on a technical wizardry and design aesthetic and any, whether or not it works. And, uh, uh, and so I and, my, uh, I and my teammates decided to try to build a Mac native equivalent to Charles. Who's used the Charles debugging proxy? Yeah, pretty excellent tool, right? Well, we wanted to build one that was Mac native and had the Mac look and feel to it. Since Charles is written in Java and has a couple of UI quirks that I'd like to see, or not quirks, but a couple of UI elements that I'd like to see changed. And so we split up our, uh, our jobs and mine was to figure out how to allow our, our proxy application to insinuate itself into, to inject itself into the system settings and become the global proxy. And I looked at a few different mechanisms by which we might be able to accomplish this, by which I might be able to change the system configuration so that our, uh, our proxy settings, or so that the system's proxy uses, uh, uses our application. Now the first thing I looked at was the system configuration framework. And to its credit, I didn't give it enough time. But under the pressure of 72 hours from beginning to end of this entire project, I had to make lots of decisions very quickly and didn't always make the right one. So I looked at system configuration framework and actually ran away screaming. It's a pure C API that has a number of different uh, handle and out parameter based mechanisms for being able to change the system configuration. And iOS developers know the system configuration framework best because of uh, the reachability sample code that's out there, including that used by, uh, by AF networking, which does it much, much better than, the, than most of the samples do. But on the Mac, the system, or the system configuration framework can do a great deal more. Now, I'm not here to talk to you about the system configuration framework, though. I'm here to talk to you about the route that I decided to take, which I thought initially was going to save me a great deal of time, but we all know what that's like. So I thought, there's got to be a better way. So I go straight to the web, and I start trying to search, and I start trying to figure out, all right, well, what if there's just a way that I can do this at the command line? Because then I can just use NS task. I can just wrap a command line tool in NS task and change uh, the system configuration that way. So I do a little bit of Google searching and I find network setup. And the network setup tool is actually pretty excellent. You can use it not just to change your proxy settings, but you can also use it to rename and reconfigure and enable and disable different uh, internet hardware devices, different hardware devices and interfaces. And it, it's, it's a very, very handy and very useful tool. So I glance through the man page and immediately get to work trying to use it uh, and decide, all right, so this is what I need. I have our app, Malcolm, and no, our design team was not involved in the design of the application icon. That was just a snapshot of a whiteboard. Uh, we have our Malcolm app, and this app is just going to use NS task to wrap network setup. Excellent. So I then write just a, a dirty, ugly little convenience method that I can use. And so for those that haven't seen NS task before, here's the basic gist of how it's used. You create instances of NS pipe and you create file handles for reading and writing. And you wire these file handles to standard in and to standard out. And then when you run the NS task, you can provide input to it. You can receive output from it. Now, if only I had actually been trying to read the result from my calls to NS task, uh, I might have spent a little bit less time trying to debug and figure out why my task was failing silently to set up my network configuration properly. So after 
trying several different approaches of refactoring this method, I then go back and say, you know what, I'll just do it at the command line. Maybe I can get it to work at the command line and then I'll know what I'm doing wrong in my code. And then I figured out what I was doing wrong in my code. Well, not wrong in my code, but my entire approach. Womp, womp. Network setup requires super user privileges. I can't exactly do sudo <laughs> in, my, uh, in my NS task. I don't know the user's password and I'm not going to ask the user for their password directly. So what I decided that I needed to do was uh, actually take a different step, take a different task. My, my desire to, um, uh, my desire to take uh, NS task and just wrap it was not, was not sufficient. So I thought, all right, well, I need something, something equivalent to something equivalent to uh, sudo to allow me to take network setup and wrap it with super user privileges. So there's got to be a better way. I go back to Google again, and this time I'm just trying different combination of keywords. And I eventually find this blog down here, or rather not, not a blog, but I find Cocoa Builder. And lots of us have used Cocoa Builder and found answers over the years. And I found a thread that eventually led me to this gem. Apple, or excuse me, authorization execute with privilege. Who's used this before? You immediately know my pain. So authorization execute with privileges is also a C API. Now, how do you think I'm doing at this point in my project, by the way, saving time by not, yeah, <laughs> by not going down the route of looking at the system configuration framework anyway? So here I'm looking at this other C API centered around these two functions, authorization create, which, in which you pass in a couple of different flags and you create a request for authorization for a thing, and then authorization execute with privileges. And you pass in your authorization that you've just created, and then you're able to execute a tool. So not using NS task here, dropping down to a lower level API, not using NS task here, and I'm able to execute code with super user privileges. This, the user will just be asked, which is pretty great. Except that this snippet that I just took verbatim from a blog and decided to bend to my will without really spending any amount of time researching the, uh, the methods or the functions involved didn't work for me. There were a couple of additional arguments that I needed, but more importantly, when I tried, so I, I, I attempted Apple authorization execute with privileges, and of course it didn't work right. And why would it? It's been deprecated since 10.7. Go to the documentation. That's moral number one from my talk. And I'll be coming back to that item over and over and over again. So, all right, back to square one. There's got to be a better way. I start Google searching again. This time, I have some additional keywords that I can try with. All right, so I've, I've now found that the word privilege shows up over and over and over again in lots of these different APIs. So I start searching Cocoa Service Privilege. And then I even find a guide even at Apple. That is the uh, creating XPC services. XPC services. That sounds familiar. I remember a WWDC session about XPC. What is that? I click through and I find the Demons and Services Programming Guide. And holy wall of text, Batman. This is a, an, enormous, uh, an enormous guide that's very, very thorough. And, uh, but I, of course, am under the pressure of time, and so I skim. I skim and I find some salient bits. That is, there are two main reasons to use XPC services, privilege separation and stability. Well, I mean, who cares about stability? Privilege separation, that's what I'm looking for. That means that I may be able to separate out my task and elevate its privileges to root or to super user. Excellent. I keep skimming and I find something else that I find encouraging. An XPC service can inherit the sandbox of the main application or it can have its own sandbox. Putting the XPC service in its own sandbox allows you to implement privilege separation. Yes, all right. So that means that I can potentially ship this app because I need to sandbox it and code sign it, but I can create a separate sandbox. So now I have my, my Malcolm application that will talk to an XPC service. Not just the network setup tool, but my, uh, my Malcolm application will talk to an XPC service oh, using the XPC APIs, of which there are two, a C-based API and an objective C-based API. And uh, then my XPC service, in turn, will take on elevated privileges and will then uh, wrap the network setup tool. If you've used an XPC service before, then you probably know the world of hurt that I'm about to get myself into. So rather than just having the one big sandbox for the entire application, I need to segregate the XPC service and network setup into its own sandbox 
and give it the, uh, the heightened privileges. So, all right, cool. I've got my plan of attack. I dedicate the entire next day. Imagine 24. Dong, 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 dong. All right, so the entire next day I spend learning how to use XPC. So let's do that right now. I'm going to go over, now I, for better or for worse, by which I mean for worse, went with the C API for XPC, uh, which was introduced, I think, in 10.7, correct me if I'm wrong, but 10.8 introduced the, uh, the Objective-C API, which is much, much, much nicer. So in order to teach myself XPC, I went ahead and created a separate sample project. That is, and this is, I'll upload the source code for uh, later today, and maybe even if you're extra nice, a Swift version. Um, but uh, I just decided to create a separate proof of concept project. And I called it XPC. <laughs> and uh, the, uh, the project here would just download an image at a URL and then set the image as the contents object on a UI views layer. Just quick and dirty and simple, just converting a downloading app into a downloading app that uses privilege separation. So how do we actually create an XPC service in our application? Step one, create another target for your, in your application. And you'll choose from the framework and library group, XPC service. Then over in the build phases for your main application, you need to set up a target dependency and a copy files build phase. And there's even an XPC services destination group that you can choose for the copy files build phase. So that phase is one that you actually need to add separate after the copy bundle resources. And then finally, you need to turn on the sandbox. An app that's got an XPC service must be sandboxed, and whether you have one sandbox for both or segregated sandboxes. So I turn on the sandbox, and in hindsight, I don't think I actually needed that outgoing connections entitlement, but it's also worth noting that when you're using XPC for privilege separation, the main application must declare the sum total or the union of all of the entitlements that its services require. So I have one service, if I have one service to do some network access and another service to do some disk access, the main application must declare both entitlements. And then the individual services can declare only the specific entitlements that they need. So if we look at the only real functional bit of the sample application that I then wanted to upgrade to use XPC, I would have a method like this. The simplest, the simplest version of code that uses NSURL session to just download an image. And then you can see I'm dispatching back to the main thread the uh, messages to my view, which is not actually an image view, it's just a UI view. Back to my view to set its, cont its layers contents object to the downloaded image. And I checked it to make sure that it worked. And then I began the work of trying to upgrade it to use XPC. But in order to use XPC, we need to understand a little bit about how an, op how an object ecosystem or an application ecosystem works in an XPC-based application. So I have a nice, big, complicated diagram for you, naturally. So the first thing that we're going to look at is the user action. When, and, I, and I will upload these slides as well. Uh, the first thing that we're going to look at is the user interaction, what's going on at the window controller when the user submits a URL for downloading. But as a quick overview of what we're looking at here is we're looking at the object in play both at the level of the main application and at the level of the XPC helper service. So I have the two different targets, each of which has its own executable. So the main application has an object that's interacting with the user, that window controller. So the user submits a URL, and then that window controller needs to create a connection to the remote object or to the remote service. And this will be launched on demand as necessary. But first, what the window controller wants it wants an object that can do some downloading, some file downloading. But it doesn't get one of these objects just plain out of the box. What it actually gets is a proxy object that it can send messages to. So just an object of type ID that must conform to a protocol of your choosing. So that protocol you will expose in two places. You will expose it as the remote object interface on the NSXPC connection instance that you create in the main application. And you will also publish it as the exported, uh, excuse me, as the exported interface from the NSXPC connection. Now let's start, th there are a lot of different objects in play here, so let's actually just start from the beginning and walk through the order of operations. So first, there in the load URL method, 
that's no longer doing the downloading. The load URL method instead now is going to create an instance of an NSXPC connection, and it's going to create an instance using init with service name. So you just pass in a reverse domain bundle identifier style label for the service that you want to launch. Then once you try to connect two lines later using the resume message, if, that, if the service isn't already running, it will be launched on your behalf. It'll be launched for you by your application. But after creating the connection object, we identify its remote object interface using the NSXPC interface class. And the NSXPC interface class really just wants a protocol to wrap. So you declare this protocol yourself. And this, this protocol is going to define the messages that can be sent to, in our case, a downloader object that will be, do the real work of going and fetching images from the internet. So after I create my connection and I configure its remote object interface, I tell it to resume. That connection is now going to attempt to launch and connect to the distant service, the XPC service. In addition, I need to create a pointer to another object. And it's of type ID because I don't know what its real type is. Uh, and I'll just call this the downloader because this is an object that, I'm, that I am receiving a proxy of from the distant service. So XPC is handling the marshalling of content and messages back and forth from one process to the other. And the downloader then needs to implement a method called download image at URL colon with reply colon. That then is the only method in our BNR download protocol that we are wrapping with our interface with protocol method there. So we create our downloader object and we send it a message. And you can see there that uh, there are actually two arguments here. You can have any number of arguments in a message that you declare to be used with an XPC service. Optionally, one of them, the last one, can be a block that gets executed by the distant object as a sort of reply. And we call these in a lot of modern APIs completion handlers, but Apple's APIs refer to this, or XPC refers to this as a reply block. But we can provide a reply block, and you see there, being our downloaded image, I just wrapped in S image. But I did that to illustrate here that you can pass arbitrary, that is objects created by you or de defined by you, back and forth through this XPC tunnel between processes. As long as they conform to the NS secure coding protocol. Now the NS secure coding protocol extends the NS coding protocol by requiring one, that you implement the class method support secure coding and return yes. And two, that instead of decode object for key, you use decode object of class colon for key colon. And this allows the, the protocol, or this allows your object to check and enforce that objects have not changed in flight, that they have not been captured, rejiggered, and then forwarded on by some sort of man in the middle attack during transmission. Your encode with coder method still looks the same. So let's look back at some of the other objects. That interface that we see in both places, both processes will have their own instance of the NSXPC interface class wrapping this custom protocol that you've created. And really, it's a straightforward protocol. Here, I have a BNR download protocol, and I have defined one or declared one method, download image at URL with reply. And that reply block will be my responsibility to execute all right, um, and that reply block will be my responsibility to execute once, um, once the download is complete. So I also have then, once you attempt a connection to, uh, to the distant object, then if the distant service, if the XPC service is not already running, it will launch. Its main function will run, which will in turn create an instance of NSXPC listener and any number of NSXPC connection handlers that are responsible, well, excuse me, just one instance of NSXPC connection handler that, or excuse me, be an R connection handler, which will be a delegate of the listener and will make decisions about whether or not to accept incoming connections. So that's actually a very short and sweet method. We create in a main for the helper class or for the helper uh, in a, an NSXPC listener object and then we create a custom object that will handle the decisions about incoming methods or uh, incoming connections. Then we set that object as the delegate of the listener and tell the listener to resume. That method will never return. Resume will never return. It'll block there because now the listener is waiting, is polling, waiting for incoming connections 
and sending delegate callbacks every time the um, uh, sending delegate callbacks every time the listener receives an incoming connection request. Then the BNR connection handler receives any one of the NSXPC listener delegate protocol methods. So here's the only one that really matters. Listeners should accept new connection. Here you configure the incoming. Um, uh, here you configure the incoming connection by setting its exported interface and its exported object, and then you tell the connection to resume. Here I've created an instance of BNR Downloader, and that is the object that actually implements or adopts our BNR Download protocol and does the real work of the download. <coughs> then the, uh, we tell the connection to resume, and now we have our bidirectional communication between the two NSXPC connection objects. Now we have the BNR Downloader object, which is represented in two places. We have the actual concrete instance over here in the XPC service, but it's being proxied by an object in the application. Now the application can send that object messages like, go download this thing for me. Download image at URL. Uh, and now this is the object that actually does the download so there I have our NSURL session with the completion handler. All the work is being done here by the downloader on the side of the XPC service. And then we are also executing the reply block once the download is complete. And that reply block is what was passed in by the NS window controller when it attempted the download in the first place. That's XPC, clear as mud, right? Now, there is more to this story but about three or four minutes ago, I was told that I had five minutes remaining. And I'd love to tell you the rest of this story, and so I encourage anybody to reach out to me or find me afterward, and I can tell you how it ends and how to use XPC services specifically for privilege separation. What we've seen here is now a, a complete overview of XPC services as they're meant to be used. The short version of the rest of the story is that an XPC service cannot have elevated privileges above the main, that of the main application. And so the short answer is use SM job bless to bless a mock service. And I have additional slides there, and I can provide additional links and resources to you. But doot, 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 doot. Right? <laughs> but the short answer is spend an hour, read the documentation. Spend an hour, read the documentation, and then you will know everything you need to know to not spend a day and a half losing your mind going down the wrong rabbit hole. Uh, you can reach me via at Wilkie, and I'll post a link to these slides. And uh, I also gave uh, this talk back home in Atlantis, and I think that may have been recorded, so I'll post a link to that as well, if in fact it was. But you can reach out to me, and I'd be happy to continue to answer questions and help out however I can for anybody that needs to implement XPC in an arcane way and would like to talk to me about it. Thank you. Would you like to